good to be back. Uh, we were away at Vancouver, Jana and I, um, to celebrate our sixth wedding anniversary and also to celebrate the last one before a kid arrives. So <laughs> thank you for letting us do that. Um, yeah, it's good to be back. Jana's actually away at a, she's speaking at a retreat today. So I've been a bachelor all weekend. So yeah, if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Romans 8? And we're going to read from verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption as children of God, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you will open our eyes and open our ears to see you and to hear you in you. We pray that um, you'll soften us where we need to be softened, you'll convict us where we need to be convicted. Um, and, you pray, and I pray that as I present your word that you speak in, in me, with me, through me, and as always, especially in spite of me. Um, and may we see you anew this morning. We pray and ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, um, it's been two weeks since Easter. And I don't know about you, but Easter is kind of one of my favorite services of the year to do. Um, it's kind of, it represents the center of our faith. Um, you know, we all know it's that moment when we get to celebrate that Jesus came and he died for our sins, but he rose again and he rose again victoriously. It's easy, I think, for most of us to get excited about Easter. It's easy for us to get pumped up. As a worship minister myself, you know, I have no trouble getting pumped up for Easter. In fact, I think most of you saw how pumped up I was at Easter when I managed to drop my guitar in the middle of the stage and, create a, and crack a little hole on it. And, uh, but that's another issue. We won't get into that. I, I, am, I am healing from that wound. Um, <laughs> But on Easter, it's easy for us to celebrate. It's easy for us to be victorious. And what I find most interesting about Easter is that while it's so easy for us to get victorious, it is just as easy, if not easier, for us to slip back after the service is over, back into the way things were before. And of course, I speak for myself more than anyone else. It's surprising how quickly I can go from victorious to complaining Easter Sunday to Easter Monday. And so these last two weeks, I've been kind of wondering, what is it about Easter that we keep forgetting? Or what is it about Easter that we miss so that it leaves us so quickly? And after much thought, I think, I think the thing we forget, and it might seem a little rudimentary, but we forget that when on Easter, when Christ rose from the dead, that meant God won. That meant God was victorious. In the eternal conflict between good and evil, Easter is the moment God won. And I realized that as I look back at my life as a Christian, I've spent very little time thinking about the fact that God won. It's easy for me to say, you know, God, 
it's, I think a lot about the fact that God has saved my sin. God has um, healed me. God has called me as, as his own. But I don't think about God has won. And I think in our world, we have forgotten what it means when we say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the moment when God is victorious. And I think perhaps why that's so is because we've lost what it means to actually be victorious. You see, in our world, I feel that we don't really have many situations where we can claim clear-cut victory in anything. Look at our wars and uh, conflicts all over the world. They don't really have that defining moment when we say, and we won. No, our wars kind of just peter on until they run out of steam. Even in our own personal victories that we experience, they're so quickly replaced by the next issue, the next problem that we have to deal with. The only place I think we can see clear-cut victories in our society today, honestly, is when a bunch of people try and chase a ball over whatever court or field that you're playing in. It's only in sports, I feel, where we can definitively say someone won and someone lost. When the Seahawks won their Super Bowl, we as a city, I feel, got to experience for a little bit what it meant to feel like a victorious people. Uh, am I right? You could feel it in the air. People walked around with a little bit more swagger in their steps. There was a big feeling of pride in the city of Seattle. People were happier. We didn't even care that the weather was crappy. You know, there was and I read article after article about how, you know, now that the Seahawks have won, this is going to change not only Seattle sports, but it's going to change Seattle City, Seattle the city. Because now, for the first time in a long time, we were the city of champions. The si even, we were so optimistic that even for one brief moment, we thought maybe the Mariners might actually be good this year. <laughs> Let me repeat, it was for one brief moment, but it was there. Victory changed us as a city, but it only changed us for a little while. Because soon the news of the Seahawks' victory left the front pages of the newspaper. Soon the 12th man banners that scattered our city started to come down. And the clouds returned, and the rain, and with it our Tao spirits. We realized that our victory, even though it was really sweet, it was fleeting. Victory. We were victorious, but only for a little while. Next week, the NFL draft happens, and the whole season starts all over again. The Seahawks will no longer be reigning champions, they'll just be defending champions. 31 other teams are going to try and wrestle the crown away from them. Victory, no matter how sweet, seems to be something that doesn't last in our world. And I think maybe. We carry that with us when we come into Easter. We shout our hallelujahs, we declare the victory of our God over Satan and all of his minions. And then Easter Monday comes around, and the next crisis hits us, and we realize that the world seems so much the same. And perhaps, maybe in our most unconscious part of our mind, we let ourselves believe that maybe Christ's victory on Easter, that too was a fleeting victory. Because people still get sick, people die. Our business and our politics still get corrupted. Nations still war. Planes still disappear over the ocean. Ferries sink. Mudslides bury families. Tornadoes rip through communities. And our newspapers are a catalog of human woe. So much of the world seems to have gone on the same since that first Easter that maybe sometimes we, we let ourselves think that maybe Christ's victory, maybe he was a little premature in declaring victory because the cycle of suffering and death seems to be the status quo. But scripture tells us otherwise. In Romans 6, 
Scripture tells us exactly what Christ won when he died for us. In verse 8 it reads, Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we, all, we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So in the same way, we can count ourselves. Dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Christ, when he died on the cross and when he rose again, he saved all of us who believe in him. He saved us from the powers of sin and death. He saved us to become his people. Through the resurrection, Christ defeated every power of evil. And more importantly, I feel, the resurrection not only saved us now, but when Christ rose again from the grave, he opened up a brand new future for us, for the world. When Christ rose from the grave, it changed everything about where we were headed. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes and he describes this future that Christ opened up when he rose from the grave. He writes, Christ has, raised, has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then and then when he comes, when he comes. Sorry, I lost one. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. And then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed, the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. He promises to us, both here and in many other places in Scripture, that Easter is not the final chapter of our story. I think sometimes why it's easy for us to slip back after Easter Sunday into our status quo is because we might think that was the end of the story. But Easter is not the end. Easter opens up the promise that Christ will also return to us. And when he does, he's going to claim ultimate victory, as this passage speaks of. <clears throat> he's going to eliminate every force of evil that stands against him. Sin and death will be defeated. Satan and all the powers of hell will be destroyed. The evil that resides within us will be expunged. The evil outside that persecutes us, over. Everything that pollutes God's creation, everything that causes suffering, pain, and sorrow. When he comes again, he will get rid of it. And not only that, he will make everything right. We will be raised imperishable. Our bodies and our minds will be broken no more. Creation will be restored to its glory. And our world will be at an everlasting peace. This is what we hope for. This is the hope of Easter. That when Christ rose from the grave, he promised he's going to finish the work someday. And our passage today in Romans 8, it talks about hope. In this hope, this is the hope that we were saved. A hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Generally speaking, I think hope is one of those words that we tend to misunderstand. Because when we use hope in a normal sentence, we're talking about, you know, some optimism for some future desired outcome. 
And we only ever talk about hope when we, we are talking about things we're not 100% sure will happen. You know, we say, I hope the Seahawks win again this year. Um, more, you all say, I hope the Seahawks win all, win all this year. I would like to say and go on public record that I would like to pack, I hope the Packers win, but that's it. Yeah. But I, you know, we say, I hope I get that promotion. I hope my kid picks the right school and the right degree. I hope I make my flight connections. Or if you're feeling especially lucky, we say, you know, I hope this arbitrary bunch of numbers that I pick, that's what's gonna win me the lottery. <coughs> we say to people, I hope for the best for you. And we say that because we know that the best may not actually be the actual outcome. Hope is for things that might happen. But in the Bible, the word hope takes on a whole different meaning. When Paul writes in Romans 8, 25, we hope for what we do not have. We wait for it patiently. He's not suggesting that we might get this. He's not asking us to cross our fingers, to make our wish list, and I guess for lack of a better word, hope. But when the Bible talks about the word hope, it's talking about things that are certain and sure. When Paul says we hope for what we do not have, he is saying, while we do not have it now, someday we will. Because what we hope for is the second coming of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that he is going to bring. And this will happen without a doubt. Paul says that in this, Paul says in this passage that basically creation gets this better than we do. Because the whole creation at least has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Creation is groaning because it implicitly knows that its redemption will come someday. It is groaning not in despair but in eager anticipation. It is groaning because it knows what's going to happen. It is groaning because it knows the end of the story. And thanks to the Holy Spirit, all of us who call upon the name of the Lord, we have that same knowledge and that same hope. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And all will be made right. This is our hope. This is what we hope for. We don't hope for things that might happen, but we hope for Christ's return and his ultimate victory, which is inevitable. It's going to happen just like the sun rises every day, Christ is going to come back. It is a sure thing. And I think maybe that's the peace we forget every Easter. We are a people of hope. And so the question remains, at least I ask the question, so if we really are people of hope, if we are people waiting for our Lord to come, what does that mean now? How are we supposed to live while we wait for this inevitable coming of the kingdom of God? Because I don't think it just means, all right, let's all just go home and chill out until that happens. And I see four ways that we're supposed to live, that we're called to live, if we have to call if we call ourselves people of hope. The first, th the first thing is that we are called to mourn and lament the way sin and death still exist today. This is important because our hope is for things that will happen in the future when Christ returns, but He hasn't yet. The kingdom is not fully here yet. In verse 18, Paul starts out by saying that our, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There are going to be present sufferings. Even though on Easter morning, sin, death, Satan and all his powers were defeated, they have not been eliminated from our world and we know that all too well. Though God promises us 
resurrection power. Death still clings to us. Our bodies break down. Pain and suffering remain a constant in our experiences and a constant in our world. And I think the right response for people of hope should be to mourn and lament that fact, to groan as creation groans. We mourn and lament that because Christ has not come back yet. And we're still waiting. This is why we sing, come Lord Jesus, come, and we should sing it earnestly. Because as long as he has not come back, sin and death will cling to us. We are called to mourn with those who mourn, to stand by the ones who suffer. Um, and this is something I have to say, we're pretty good at at the harbor. We are pretty good at that. We are people comfortable with sharing our sufferings, praying for our sufferings, helping each other. We are open in that way. But we must remember that when we mourn, and what we mourn, are the wounds inflicted by a defeated foe. We cannot never, we cannot ever allow ourselves to think that sin and evil will ever have a shot at winning the day. These are the cheap shots of sin and death, the death throes of the devil. We must remember that as we mourn, as Paul writes, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed in us. So people of hope mourn and lament sin and death. But a people of hope also rejoice and rejoice greatly because when they see God breaking through their world. As I said, the harbor is a place where I think we find it easy to mourn our collective brokenness. But that is not enough for the people of God and for the people of hope. Because to be truly hopeful, we must learn how to rejoice. We rejoice because even though Christ has not come back yet, His kingdom and His power is breaking through our world. It broke through when our God who was dead rose from the grave and opened up the book of life to each and every one of us. That's worth celebrating. That's worth rejoicing. It breaks through when generation after generation after generation, from the first disciples all the way to the, today, declare that Christ has risen from the grave. I think when, when Madeline wrote, read that story, the resurrection story on Easter morning, it wasn't just a cute moment, it wasn't just, oh, how nice. But that moment, that was the kingdom of God breaking through in our midst. Because the next generation was proclaiming again, Christ is risen. It was us getting a foretaste of what was to come. And that is worth rejoicing. The kingdom of God breaks through when people who are lost stumble upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and find salvation and find hope. It breaks through when the gospel is shared throughout the world. It breaks through when couples reconcile when bitter grudges are buried, whenever we stumble upon anything that is true, that is good, that is pure, anything that is beautiful. Scripture tells us that when we find these things, stop and ponder, because that is God's kingdom breaking through our world, and that is worth rejoicing. Every time we find these things, we get to see the power of the resurrection, we get to see what our future will look like. And here's the thing about rejoicing. It's not an inward activity. We can't do that quietly. There's no such thing as quiet rejoicing. Rejoicing demands to be heard all over the world. Our rejoicing should echo the hallelujahs of angels. And our rejoicing should be so overt that people will see and hear us and know our God who saves. So just as we mourn, we must also rejoice. And thirdly, as people of hope in the coming kingdom of God, we must try to live as if the kingdom is already here. 
we are the people who know what the end of the story is going to be. We know that Christ is going to be victorious. We know that we will be redeemed. We know that sin and death will be defeated. And we know that nothing is going to stop that from becoming a reality. And so, we need to try and live as if it's already here. We need to try and live by the principles of the future kingdom of God and not by the realities of today. Now what do I mean by this? I mean, if the future kingdom of God is one where there is no barrier between peoples, where every race and every tongue, every age, every, every person is able to come and be equal under the banner of God, then we try and live today as if that's true. We try and live as if there is no barrier between peoples. We stand up and we denounce racism, we denounce sexism, we denounce ageism and ethnocentrism. We, de we denounce all the things that divide us because we are trying to live as if the future is already here. We try to love each other as God loves us. And if God's future is where God will rule in perfect justice and perfect mercy. And then today we try and do justice and we try and love mercy and we try and walk humbly without God. Today we try and reject injustice wherever it shows up. Today we renounce mercilessness. We embrace grace. If in God's future kingdom there will be no hungry, there will be no thirsty, there will be no homeless, well then, we try our best to make that true today, too. And let me emphasize, I say we try, we try, we try, because we all know that until Christ returns, we'll never achieve it. Christ still needs to rescue us. But we try to live as if the kingdom is here today. But we know we will never perfectly do it. Sin and death still exist, and we are not fully redeemed. But we try to live like this because we have the hope that the kingdom will come. And from today until the day when Christ returns, we get to practice how we're going to live in eternity. I find that really appealing. We get to practice how we live in eternity. So we mourn sin and death. A people of hope also rejoice because God is breaking through. And the people of hope try, as best they can, to live like it's already here. But the fourth one is also important. A people of hope do not despair. Our world today is in a long term one. And we read of wars happening, wars threatening to happen. Our headlines are more often bad news than good, and in our own lives, I'm sure we can come up with a laundry list of things that aren't going right. But we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to despair. Because we have this hope in the sure knowledge that our Lord is coming. Rescue is coming. Redemption is coming. And someday every pain and every sorrow will be healed, every tear will be wiped away. Someday our world, which is now defined by violence, hate, and death, will be defined by grace and by mercy and by love, by beauty and by life. Our God is coming. So we hope for what we do not already have. We wait for it patiently, because our sufferings cannot compare with the glory about to be revealed in us. With that, we come to his table this morning. The table is another way that we can get reminded of our hope. Because the table is not just a time for us to look back at that first supper, that last supper. It's not just time for us to look back at that first communion. 
But this is one of God's ways of reminding us time and time again of what we get to look forward to. To the marriage supper of the Lamb. When He will return and He will take His church as His own. This is our hope. So, on the night Jesus was betrayed, He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, take and eat this, for this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for the many forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the, that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let me pray. So Lord, we pray. We pray you plant this hope deep within us. This hope that you will one day come back and make all things new and all things right and all things beautiful. And as we take this bread and drink from this cup, we ask you first to make, take these common elements and make them holy. And we pray that you'll help us as we eat and as we drink to remember not just your sacrifice for us, but your victorious coming again. Pray and ask all this in your mighty name. Amen.